five books of the Old Testament um, in Exodus. You know, there's Moses out there floating uh, on, a, uh, <laughs> on a basket in the Nile, and he gets picked up and, um, by the Pharaoh's daughter and uh, is raised as uh, the, the grandson of the Pharaoh who had ordered all male children to be drowned and so on. And uh, then he escapes after committing a murder when he was 17 or 18 years old and defending uh, someone from, uh, that was being persecuted, one of the Isra Israelites moves out to the Sinai and uh, is out walking one day 40 years later after he married and children and he's a shepherd and all of a sudden he encounters uh, a, a burning bush and this is a bush that um, doesn't doesn't get consumed it just keeps burning and a voice comes from the from the burning bush and says to uh, Moses it calls out name Moses Moses now this is 1300 years before the birth of Christ that's 13 centuries that's 800 years before Lao Tzu uh, so this is uh, one of our most ancient texts and stories and it's the only place where God's name is given and um, God yells out Moses and the first words that Moses says to God are here I am and then he starts telling Moses this weird story. You're going to go out and you're going to free all of your people. I'm going to send you to the promised land. You're going to free them all. And, and he said, who am I? Who am I to do this? He said, well, I will be with you, it says in Exodus. And finally, um, but he said, who, what is your name? He says, what shall I, what am I going to say to these people? And he said, my name is, I am that I am. And that shall be my name for all future generations. That is my name. So the name I am is really the name of God. And you have to ask yourself the question every time you use it. You know, in the book of Joel it says, let the weak say, I am strong. How do you declare your I am's? Because most of your I am's are associated with your ordinariness with your physical world, with uh, your mind that you're speaking about. But when you begin to say, you know, I am well, which I say to myself, and I've had a diagnosis that tells me I'm not supposed to be able to say that, but uh, I know the greatest gift I've ever been given is the gift of my imagination, the gift of um, being able to place anything in there and put a do not disturb sign around it and, and super glue my intentions to that inner, inner place. And just, and you, you mentioned the words Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. He also said, I am the resurrection. He didn't say, I am the crucifixion. <laughs> and we've placed so much emphasis on that and the world, on the suffering, and not enough, I think, on this being who has transcended and, and, and is that being of light. But I ask every one of you watching, every one of you in here, to be very careful when you use the words I am, because you say I am weak. When, when Moses said, what is your name? He didn't, God didn't say, um, my name is I hope things work out. <laughs> you know? Or my name is I will be. <laughs> because to say I will be means I am not. He said, I am that I am, meaning everything that exists, I am that I am. Which means you. And you can use the name I am. And one of the things Eckhart, uh, you and I talked about in preparation for doing this is not only to look at it from sort of a academic philosophical point of view but but how can we apply what our teachings really bring to the world because um, this world we're in right now I mean this it, it's it needs what we're speaking about here in a big way it needs an I am God in the sense of I am love uh, as what we walk around with in our peace and in our quiet because this is the first time in the history of this country that a child born today's life expectancy is less than its parents. It's never happened before. Uh, and its expectancy for earning what it can earn is seriously diminished from what, um, what its parents were. And we have, um, you know, we have a nation of addicts I mean, not just to illegal drugs and so on, but to just prescriptions, you know, people, I mean, in the year, this is, this is a shock you, in the year 1970, there were two billion prescription tablets <clears throat> prescribed in America, two billion, 
individual tablets, 1970. In 2007, one generation later, that number is 113 billion in one generation. I mean, who doesn't have four or five or six prescription drugs that they're taking? And I mean, my daughter just lost her best friend's fiance to an overdose of, of, of uh, these prescription drugs, these painkillers that, that people are taking, antipsychotic drugs. I mean, we're loaded with them. Not only that, but I mean, our, our food supply has been contaminated. I mean, it's like people are, t we have 31% of young people obese. What, what is going on? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a lack of consciousness. You know, the, you know, genetically modified organisms put into our foods, you know, and violence. Last year in the city of Chicago, 242 students were shot to death in one city, in one school system. You know, it's like you know, just a few days ago in Nevada, somebody walked in with a Uzi or an AK-47 and blew away seven or eight people in Carson City. I want the people who are, you know, who are voting to end the sale of these massive weapons that are so capable of killing people to stand up and be counted. I mean, violence, contamination, addictions, we get enough people thinking that I am God and I am love and projecting it. I mean, one of the things I got from, from watching what you did with Oprah is the awareness that um, when we reach elevated levels of consciousness that you're speaking about, when we are totally here, now, present, that we don't just affect ourselves, but we affect we literally affect those around us, right? I mean, is that, yes. is that what you're teaching? I mean, yes. That was very impactful to me that it's important for me to pay attention and to be astonished because, not just because I'll feel better and I'll have a, a nice conversation like this, but because the next person that I encounter will be impacted by that. And the next, and enough of us, the number of people in here, the number of people watching, I mean, I think it's what we're called to do, Eckhart. I think that's why we have a voice. I really do. It's on the people you come into contact with, the, your state of consciousness or your state of unconsciousness also gets, transmits itself. So one negative person can create a chain reaction of negativity in many others. And in the same way, a conscious person can dissolve streams of negativity. The buck stops here. You, you, if, you're, if you're conscious and non-reactive, the stream stops. It dissolves in the presence mm. that you are. And so not only do you affect those you come into contact with, you affect the collective, the underlying collective field of human consciousness. So. I feel sure that you affect countless others you never even meet because all human consciousness is connected. The consciousness of every individual human at a deeper level is part of the collective consciousness of humanity. And it's just, it's beyond people too though, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, I was with Christian Northrup, do you know Dr. Northrup? Um, just in Pasadena, we were giving a talk together and, and she was so excited just before she was going on to speak. She said, I just saw this incredible piece of research. She said that when you have a garden and you plant vegetables in the garden for you to eat, that whatever it is that you need in terms of what is missing in your life, whether it's a vitamin deficiency or whether it's your immune system deficiency or if you've got cancer or whatever it is, those plants that are nurtured by you will provide just for you what you need when you eat them, not for the person next door. It's, I mean, that's an amazing piece of research. That, uh, so it isn't just human consciousness, I think. It's like there's a symbiotic kind of thing. And it's like, there's some people, like when you walk into a room, you just know. I mean, I walked into a room once with Mother Teresa many years ago, and it's like everything changed. The, the room was in a, in a different state. Um, Patanjali had these wonderful words. He said, when you're steadfast, that means you never slip. When you're steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed towards yourself and others, 
that all living creatures will cease to feel fear in your presence. I mean, we can impact the whole, the whole sphere, the whole universe, I think, can be impacted if we just begin to recognize that we are God. We are God. It's such, T.S. Eliot had that wonderful notes. He said, we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. Yes. I don't think you have to die no. for that. I think he was speaking about death, but I don't think we are. I certainly I'm not, and I don't think you are either. No, that's also the same truth is in the parable uh, in that Jesus tells of what you traditionally called the prodigal son, mm. which actually is a very ancient uh, parable in different traditions it's used. Uh, you all probably know it. The son is the son of a rich father, and he goes out. He says to the father, give me your inheritance. And he travels to some distant land and squanders his inheritance. He becomes a beggar. In other versions of it, he even forgets who he is. He, does, he forgets that he is the son of that father. So he sits there by the roadside begging, and then the father sends messengers to him, to, sends out messengers to the distant country and they find the son and they say, do you know who you are? And, he says, no. and, and then he begins to remember and then he returns to the father's house and that's, I, that's the, what I mentioned earlier, the return movement and then for the, when he returns it says the father loves him more deeply than before. Mm -hmm. And to me that means, this is the story of humanity. Humanity losing itself in the in externals, losing connectedness with the source of all being, with the one. Not absolutely losing it, but total unawareness of it. And so we become beggars, and this is the condition of most humans who are not yet going through the spiritual awakening, which in other words is not, not really your condition anymore, but it's still the majority of people on the planet who are, who have not, who are not connected consciously with the source within themselves. So they are looking for scraps for fulfillment, and scraps is anything, uh, from the house to the car to this or that, give me a new partner, this, some, anything to, to give me fulfillment, to tell me who I am. So they're seeking it there and there. That's the condition of the, the person who has lost awareness of the source. And then the, perhaps what the meaning of the messengers is in the parable is perhaps a spiritual teacher or a spiritual teaching that somehow you come into contact with, or the messenger could be, as I see it, could also be just the suffering becomes so much that the, the pressure of it awakens you, and, the, and then you begin to realize who you are, and you return then, that means you suddenly become aware again of that deep connectedness with being, your essential oneness with being. And the meaning of what the parable says that is loved more deeply by the Father, I interpret that as meaning that when you regain awareness of being, which perhaps humans had a long, long time ago in the distant past, and that could be the reason for the, all the myths in many, many cultures of the Golden Age. Right. In many cultures on the planet, you have different versions of the myth of there was once a Golden Age when people lived in happiness, and, and mm -hmm. that, that perhaps points to the, our original connectedness with Source, then we lost it, this was our up to, up to very recently, and now returning to the home, the father's home, means to regain that awareness, but at a deeper level, because whereas before it was in your natural state, you, you may know from your own life when you have lost something, 
and then you come back to it, you appreciate it much more deeply. This applies, for example, to our awareness of nature. In the past, we lived in natural connectedness with nature and respecting nature. It was so natural, we didn't know we lived in natural connectedness with nature because nature was all there was. Then we lost it, we created a, a world that is almost um, hostile towards nature. It's one of the absurdities or dysfunctions of our condition. Right. And now there is an, an enormous awareness in many humans towards the sacredness of the natural world. We really know it, we know it more deeply now than, we, than before. Mm. So also when we go to the source, return to the awareness of that, there is an added dimension there that wasn't there when we lived thousands and thousands of years ago in natural connectedness. Now there is a conscious connectedness with source and that's the, new, the next level in human evolution. I think it is. I, and and I, think, I don't think it's an accident that um, people like yourself and myself um, uh, have an audience for that, that return to source. You know, I mean, I just did a public television special, uh, public television, um, and it's basically, the theme of it is, it's called Wishes Fulfilled, but the theme of it is that you are, that God is in every single one of us, and that they approved it really surprised me, but uh, because they're always so careful about separating out and not, you can't say you are God and you know you, you, that uh, you are divine and all of that because somebody might get upset about it and they just, it just seems to be a new way. But I'm thinking, Eckhart, as you were speaking when you're talking about the prodigal son, that it's really, I don't know if it's your story, but it is mine. And I have gotten lost on several occasions in my life. Um, I spent a lot of years in an orphanage, I spent uh, years struggling through addictions, I've spent years um, dealing with um, uh, separation and divorce and the pain of that, and now um, leukemia. Um, and each one of these has been um, almost um, a way for uh, me to uh, to recognize that all spiritual advances are, are preceded by a fall of some kind or another. My, my friend Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, passed away a few years ago, used to say that if you shield the mountain from the windstorms, you'll never see the beauty of the carvings. And the storms of our life, and the storms of my life, and particularly this recent one, we had talked about this earlier, about this leukemia, um, has brought me to just, um, it's brought me back to, to, you're calling it source, I'm calling it God. Um, it doesn't matter, we could call it Irene, it doesn't make any difference what we call it because the Tao that can be named is not the Tao anyway. <laughs> um, but what came into my life at this time in the last couple of years with this are just very significant people who have showed up in my life uh, uh, healing experience that I had with John of God down in uh, Brazil that um, was done uh, remotely from Brazil to Maui uh, and I was told, I mean I had someone come here to Maui, a, a physician, uh, her name was Dr. Reina Piscova, um, she's an eye surgeon in California, she wanted me to go down there because she'd heard I'd had leukemia, I couldn't go or I didn't go and um, she made all kinds of extra special arrangements for me to have uh, photos taken and all dressed in white, drinking certain kind of uh, liquids and, and having um, herbs that I was taking. And, you know, I had a healthy, a healthy level of skepticism around, you know, this kind of thing, as I'm sure many of you do as well. But I, I urge you to, um, like Talopa said, have a mind that's open to everything and attached to nothing. Like, just open your mind up to this because from here, that, the night, it was the 21st of April this year, my mother's 95th birthday. And uh, I had surgery at 7 o'clock in the morning from 
Brazil to Maui. I don't know how this gets done. I, uh, uh, and then a week later, I had to—I st stayed in bed for a whole week. I could hardly even walk. I was so ex just. I just. The day after the surgery, I got up and they, Raina had called me. She said, "Now you've had surgery." And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Well, you can't swim and you can't do yoga and you can't walk and you can't do these kind of things." And I said, "I'm going for a walk." <laughs> And I got a hundred yards from my place and I collapsed and had to be helped back and I was in bed for a week. And when they removed the sutures, which are invisible sutures, which don't exist even, um, uh, from that moment on, Eckhart, something happened to me that was so... Uh, it just... When Mary Oliver said, be astonished, and, and Rumi said, sell your cleverness and, and purchase bewilderment, I've been in a state of bewilderment since that time. Uh, I had my 71st birthday just a few weeks after that, and uh, all I wanted to do was uh, give things away. I was filming in, in San Francisco at the St. Francis Hotel, and I took a wad of $50 bills and $100 bills and just to all the homeless people that I could find. I would talk to them, and it was the most... Be and I was sobbing through this whole thing. It was like I became a basket case <laughs> uh, of love. And it's been half a year or more, and everyone I encounter and everything I see, everything just looks different. Uh, and it was, it's like a return to, uh, to an awareness that... Um, I mean, I am well. I am perfect health. I don't go to doctors now. I don't have my numbers checked. I, I, I gave up yoga for, for a year after they told me I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't do hot yoga, and I, I believed them, and my body started getting tired, and I couldn't do it. And then one morning I was just told, uh, you can go do yoga. You don't have to avoid any of that. You're, you're perfectly well. And then I met John of God in September up at uh, Omega, where we first met, um, just a few months ago. And I spent, and I, I walked amongst, there was 1,500 people a day walking past him. And I was just put in there. He had no idea who I was from anybody else. They didn't tell me, tell them how special I am, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> neglected to tell that. And, uh, and he looked at me and he just smiled. And in Portuguese, he just said, you are well. He said, please sit here and observe my interventions for the next three days, which is what I did. And it's just been, it's just been, it's just been love, I heard. It's just been love, love, love. I mean, it's almost like God entered... Somehow they put a God consciousness in me that I thought I had because I'd been writing about it. Um, and the old ego, I mean, it's always, it's, it's always there. I don't know if you know this. I don't even know if I want to mention this, but I'm going to do it, obviously. <laughs> you know, there's a list out on the, uh, uh, on the Internet of the 100 most spiritually influential people alive. Have you seen this list? Yeah. Yeah, you have. Yeah. <laughs> you and I are going to have to have a talk here. So they have the hundred from the top to the bottom. And this is where the ego and the spirit are just so... It's just such an interesting thing. <laughs> because you're listening right now to the third most spiritually influential person alive. That's me. <laughs> and that's my ego. Isn't that great? Thank you. And there's two people ahead of me on this list. <laughs> now my spirit says, you're not any better than anybody else. You're just connected to God like everyone else. This is, why would you even think that? And then the ego just is tapping me on the shoulder and said, uh, I know you can take those two guys ahead of you down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the number two spiritually influential person alive, according to Watkins, this list, is... Um, the Dalai Lama. And the number one spiritually influential, I can't even say it, spiritually influential person alive is Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> so now I don't know whether we should get together and go after the Dalai Lama and then and maybe we can arm wrestle. <laughs> But it's that funny thing, it's all the time, because I use it on my kids all the time, you know. <laughs> I even said to my ex-wife, you know, can, in your wildest dreams, could you ever imagine that you were married to the third most spiritually influential person in the world? She said, they didn't call me. <laughs> and 
notes. He said, I don't know how to break it to you, but you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> But I think that's interesting that, that you, and I just found out about that list. The day I found out about that list, I got a call from Eckhart Tolle saying, would you like to, we're going to come to Maui, we'd like to do a conference together. And I thought, this is my chance, I'm going. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you. <laughs> this is, um, yeah. <laughs> The concepts like that that come floating into your mind, uh, I saw it also, somebody sent me this right. list. Um, these concepts have to be, when they come in, they have to be dropped like hot potatoes. <laughs> because if you hang on to it, it, it at that moment, this, this, the spirit gets obscured. If you think you are somebody who is somebody, immediately that would be the denial of the reality of it. So the, the art really is the, and it's tricky because I've, had, I've seen it happen to other spiritual teachers some, and some have, were able to drop the hot potato when pe people came with beliefs and projections about them. And I've seen others who, who took it on board and became burdened by mm. some self-concept that others were projecting onto them. This is particularly uh, more likely to happen if you live in an ashram and you're surrounded only by people who think you are the greatest. Mm. Then it's, it's very easy to slip into that and start to believe in some concept of who you are, right. which immediately obscures the power of spirit. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, I'm sure you know who uh, Rabindranath Tagore, the great uh, an Indian poet who won the, the Nobel Prize back in the 1920s. He talked about the ego. He had this great observation poetically. He said, um, I went out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. <laughs> he adds his loud voice to every word I utter. <laughs> he is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame. But I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that's, Beautiful. that's Tagore, that's the ego, yeah. That's for Tagore. <laughs> and the, uh, in, I mentioned briefly yesterday when with Ram Das, um, just, I'm sure you can recognize it in your, perhaps in your own experience, but it might be helpful for some of you. When I, let's say, just we'll take a moment of, Coming here in the car from where we are staying to here to have this dialogue, um, you c at any moment you can be either more a form identity, in which case you, you, your mind functions through your history, who your concepts of who you are that others have told you and you believe and you have created that mental self. And at any moment you can be either more, dwell more in this form identity of who you are, my name, my history, my achievements, or my failures, they're all form identity. Or you can be an essence identity, which is simply an, an aware presence, where you don't need to remember anything or think anything, just be that field of awareness. So the only way I can ever go to a, a talk, an important gathering, if I travel as spiritual teacher number one, going to meet spiritual teacher number three, <laughs> the, it, would be, it would create immediate stress mm. because I would be carrying that a, a conceptual self, a dreadful burden, but... It,